Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we're bringing you day 371. As always, with Alexei Rostovich, former advisor to the Office of the President of Ukraine, Lieutenant Colonel, and Mark Fagan, Russian opposition politician. Also, our thanks are still going to our dedicated members, Marmil, Jmer, and of course, Klaus Perditis. Thank you guys for sticking with us and supporting us to the degree that you do. You help us to translate new materials. There are more coming. And we're thinking to start naming some of our members every stream. So today's additional kudos go to Darren Matthews, Vadim Chirdak, Tatiana Zadarozhna, Arcane Math, and Hill, and Topia SR. Deep sincere thank you guys. And now without further ado, let's go into day 371. Enjoy. Hey, glad to see you all on Fagin Live. It is Wednesday, March 1st. Time is 10.06 in Kiev p.m. and 6 minutes past 11 p.m. in Moscow. We salute to all of our viewers who are joining us today at day 371 with Alexei Rostovich. We are uh, running a little late today. Alexei was uh, running errands. I'm also traveling, so sorry. This is uh, somewhat an unroute program. But as always, I do ask all of our viewers to subscribe to Fagin Live in the description to that video, also to Alexei Rostovich's channel, and if you are listening or watching that in English, do not forget to subscribe to your private ear station. All right, let's start with some major news, probably. China. China is one of the main topics internationally. Of course, they are trying to play on a field that we started to discuss in the previous stream. They're trying to play their influence and affect the situation with war. And I would say that uh, for now everything goes along the non-negotiable scenario between China and the West. And situation is in somewhat development. People are, are talking already about possible UAVs that China can supply to Moscow. Some talking heads are talking about ammo and some materials and components that China can send Moscow, can supply Moscow with. And that is on the background of the principles voted in their voiced in their documents about sovereignty and integrity, but this uh, somehow goes to the escalation bucket for now. How far do you think it will go? What is interesting, Mark, in the last few days, I was surprised by a group of very sharp statements from United States towards China. The biggest of them was uh, blaming China as the source of COVID, um, essentially pointing at the finger, uh, pointing the finger at the laboratory and saying that China was behind the global pandemic of COVID. Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs already came out and asked to not speculate on this topic, but this is a serious accusation in the global scale, basically, of provoking an artificial crisis and concealing the information about its source. Second, today American Congress voted to ban TikTok. Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs reacting in line of why are you afraid of children's stories. Secretary of State Blinken of the United States is in Central Asia, in a very interesting for China zone, Kazakhstan and uh, the other stands in that area. So these are screaming news pieces. What they are screaming about is that collective West warns China rather sternly to not participate actively in this military conflict with equipment, military munitions or any support to Russia. China, in essence, just uh, stuck his head up to try to participate in the military process. Immediately, it caused a very serious reaction of the West, which uh, might mean, I don't know if it 100% uh, means that, but it might mean that the West has a very strict scenario how to deal with China if China becomes a little too active in the world. So they cannot, you think, 
allow China to be at the table of negotiations with them to try to negotiate the outcome of this war. Do not want or do not uh, or, or can't. Uh, yeah, regardless, uh, they definitely are against China participating in that. And two of the major slaps in recent time was uh, accusing Putin in being responsible for MH17 shooting down, uh, being shot down over Ukraine, and uh, China in releasing COVID onto the world. So this might be a early precursor to the next Cold War. And basically telling China and uh, other possible uh, Chinese allies that things are decided, we're already taking sides, we are seeing this conflict through, do not engage. And uh, of course, this is uh, the war in Ukraine is the core culprit in these communications. We also understand that China is in a precarious position, they cannot push too hard, they have very big disbalance in uh, their economy, in their population where they have very poor villages and very rich upper middle class and uh, billionaires in certain geographical areas. So it's the country of contrasts. But China is 85% dependent upon exporting their goods to Europe and United States. And every sanctions in this regard are super painful to China. And uh, this is what uh, the West seems to be indicating, hinting towards. Do not mess with this, otherwise you will face very serious circumstances consequences to that. So remember we talked about Bali, that they might agree how to split the world. There might be another eventuality such as an next Cold War. Or it could be a third option where it kind of continues to go helter, skelter one way and then a little bit the other without clear definition. What we're looking at now very sincerely reminds me of the second variant of the possible Cold War scenario unfolding. And this is exactly what I'm thinking, that the scenario where China actually supports the Russian Federation with munitions, with supplies, with anything that can be used for this war, is very minuscule. China doesn't really want to have this uh, conflict. Because another side is uh, you are in counter position to your own statement. Your statement says that you are for territorial integrity, so you're not acknowledging Crimea to being annexed by Russia, you still consider it to be Ukrainian territory. And then you do what? Come and supply the belligerent party in this war, the one that went to attack? Um, so that uh, would definitely be another question to pose to China. I think they will start opening some supplies to Russia, but nothing military related. Uh, also good point Forbes posted recently, in June Russia will have a dilemma to continue funding this war or to keep paying pensions, because they will not be able to do both at the same time. And what will happen in Ukraine? At that time, Ukrainian offensive, Russian army Ukrainian offensive will run out of steam, and that's when Ukraine will supposedly start to push back and roll them back. And this will be another fork in this conflict that will be a decision point for the world and will basically a scenario picking of the world. And the signs of that fork already are here. United States are saying, we don't care if you attack Crimea, and an attempt of a big player to come to the board was taken very sharply and they were sent messages that you are not welcome here, do not come to that board. So these are significant signs if to conclude that block that there is a scenario. China probably is aware as well that there is a scenario. They wanted to participate in this conflict and they got a very hard no, do not join. And of course, uh, they're a big country, they're the second economy of the world, they're one of the members of Security Council and the United Nations, but they were told down, they were told to stand down. 
Yes, Alexei, I hear what you say, because in this light it is a very strong message, because on one side he, the West is making efforts to not allow that new union between China and Russia, and the other side is that they're not even going to let China be at the table of negotiations as equal, not even as a regional power, superpower, that they should not be participating in that negotiation. Because I, and I personally think Russia was already given to China at the, after this war, it was decided. No, 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 Mark, I don't think so. Russia has value for the West. It was important for them as the buffer between the East and the West. So, one more important thing, when China is talking about the territorial integrity, the other side of that statement is also about Belarus, about their territorial integrity, and Lukashenko's visit to China I think it's also an attempt to use China's rhetoric to cool Moscow down a bit, to send the message that China also has special relations with Belarus and China does support territorial integrity. And recently they had a four-hour meeting, they concluded some agreements, that's a lot. And I suspect Belarus will engage China closer, trying to use their influence to stop Moscow from any shenanigans with their territory. And some people might say that I'm romanticizing things, but I'll repeat the thesis of about a week long uh, stream that Moscow is being led into a very narrowing corridor where the end is going to be nigh. Lukashenko is part of that picture and uh, Moscow's tentacles are being torn off from its neighbors. That is a signal to all the players of the big and global world that Russian Federation will need to make a strategic decision altogether, not even about the Ukrainian war or their war with Ukraine, but about their general position in the world. That is why people were, I think, surprised when after Moscow left Kherson, and, uh, and yes, there were some consultations, not official negotiations, but at least consultations with Kremlin, uh, to try to probe and see if they would understand the difficulty of their position so that the world can uh, put this war out. And Putin revealed himself as a non-negotiable person who decided to send everybody to hell and said he'll continue with his politics regardless of all the push. And that's, I think, when the decision was made that uh, Russia needs to lose it. I do remember that meeting, uh, Burns' visit to Ankara in Turkey. And the, there was uh, Narushkin who was meeting with Burns, and uh, Burns uh, did mention that Narushkin had a very, was very aggressive in his uh, communication, so that might be one of those signs. By the way, you do have some sort of dancing lights or discourse. What's going on? Now I was just checking something on my screen. Sorry, Mark. So yeah, it is a very hard story. It tells us that scenario exists and they do not see other participants in this scenario. And I don't think China is happy to see that too. Right. But it is a good news for us, because uh, that means that China will not be effectively supporting Russia. If they are wise people and reasonable people, they will not be supplying any military support to Russia. And so far they have demonstrated China that they do. They are very logical. So this is a disappointing moment for Moscow. And the war, if it's not in its final stage, it's in a very decisive stage now. You can also see that on that informational background. That they are running out of resources and Moscow is facing several very bad choices. 
Uh, one is worse than the other. If you turn left, that thing dies. If you turn right, you die. But yeah, Bar uh, Alexei, they're not believing in their defeat still. They're still in their own world. They don't, right? No, they don't believe. That's my feeling of Moscow, and that's pretty precise. They do not believe they will lose. We have about 300,000 watching us. Please continue sharing links and click the like button. It's a bit better dynamics for us to see more people are able to join us at that hour. Yeah, it is better for the audience, but it's uh, harder for me because it's... Uh, martial law here after a certain hour so i cannot travel too much in the city oh yeah so guys please respect alexei because otherwise uh he will not be just jobless he might even go to jail um so okay dear viewers there is another news coming out right now that in yeisk which is russian territory they have an airfield burning about 10-15 minutes ago, they started, uh, the messages started to come through that there were some explosions on the airfield. And there are some videos and pictures showing fire and smoke. There is no information about the airport itself and what is damaged and if anybody was wounded or killed as a result. So this is not a single event. There were several events before the day before and the day two days before that. So basically from St. Petersburg down south to Azov Sea, right? Yes, so before we go to the map of active military actions, uh, do you think it's uh, targeting? It's a process of targeting going on and they're figuring out the capabilities? I think it's a special topic that might deserve a special stream, but I would say that it might be for now, I would just say that these are partisans who are becoming active. And if Putin now is talking about possibility to for Russia to be separated by the West into different regions, I would just play along with Putin here and say that maybe Ural Republics is uh, attacking the western part of Russia via partisan detachments. So let's just play along with that narrative. Oh, you know, Putin actually called them scoundrels. Yeah, and yeah, he is attacking possible threats within Russia. Putin is a horrible figure for Russia, Mark. He brings only terror and horror and death to the country. And given their hard economic situation, I think part of their statements today about the need to harden everything, harden all the controls in Russia is also aiming at the future eventualities that might start unfolding when they run out of money, when people will be revolting about food and income. And basically his message to his people is that we will continue pulling you out of your life, lives and sending to the front to die and will not compensate you for that. And if you will try revolting or rebelling against that, we will find men or means to put you in jail or to shut you up. And this is how the government of Russia is taking care about its citizens. Well, this is predictable. Speaking of perspectives here, I think that Ural partisans still have a lot of capabilities and they will continue practicing their skills and the lights will be coming ablaze brighter and brighter night after night throughout Russia. Now about the front line. Yes, let's bring it up and let's go over that. In the last two or three days, they of course uh, shelled civilians again. First of all, Kherson region, Kharkov in the north, Donetsk region, of course. Kriminchuk, I saw in the news, yes, there was an attack by Shahids. Today, two, or according to some statements, three X-22s. There was a small strike. And every day, 
there are unfortunately human tragedies happening throughout the country and uh, people are dying and we'll try to support some of those as much as we can from the proceeds of your activity in our store now about the front line in Vugledar down south they're still trying to push but they already have lost over 160 armor units in that area New York Times actually called this one to be the biggest defeat, uh, the biggest uh, tank defeat in this uh, war. Yeah, there's other news uh, writing that it's 130 tanks and armored vehicles that Russia has lost. Yeah, some sources say 130, I've seen 160. But the statements themselves, the title of the biggest tank defeat in this war, it deserves attention. That just outlines the skill set of Russian commanders who are sending their troops to go and die. And today there was another, I thought, funny video when a tank team is sitting in some little trench they dug for themselves near the burnt-out tank, and they're pointing at the tank saying, well, it's there, it's burning, but we're still winning, we will win. And they're still not evacuated, they're basically sheltering in place, waiting for maybe somebody to come save them. So, Bakhmut, Avdiivka, Marinka, still hot areas. Bakhmut, we did acknowledge the difficult position there. Today, the speaker of our military came out and said that we are not giving up on Bakhmut. The command is continuing to defend the positions. Uh, some Russian forums are talking that Ukraine is actually pushing back, but that needs to be re-verified because it's their statements. In Kriminaya and up north, uh, they are attempting some actions, but without much success. So Bakhmut is uh, the center point of the events today unfolding in the front. So you think Bakhmut is still going to stay for a while? Yeah, uh, we well, it depends upon the military command. They might make a decision to withdraw from Bakhmut, but leaving it doesn't really have any significant consequences. We'll just push uh, out and take the next line of fortifications. So you're welcome to continue uh, Russian troops and uh, grind yourself off the next level, the next row of fortifications. So, direct, direct uh, value of Bakhmut is to grind the attacking enemies down. At the moment when the city is too wasted, is too ruined, it cannot be used as a fortification to effectively destroy enemy troops, then you can withdraw from that and go full back to the next line of defenses. So, you should understand that it makes sense to hold the town for as long as it serves the purpose the moment uh, when it stops uh, serving that purpose, uh, the military can withdraw to the next positions. But I think our peoples are mature enough and we've seen everything during this war, so we will understand the logic of our command, even if they decide to withdraw from Bakhmut. Remember, Severodonetsk and Lysychansk, there was no catastrophe there. We withdrew there from there timely, and their situation was much worse than now. There was no yet Kharkov operation, we haven't taken Kherson back, Rammstein was not a real supportive event still, and they were dropping 45, 60,000 shells on us daily. There were actually some areas of front where, where our soldiers were shelled for 15 hours a day with their artillery. This is horrible, and still our troops held. And even now, when it is somewhat uh, sharp around Bakhmut, we do understand that our counteroffensive is nigh, it's imminent. We are waiting for more materials to come to start that, and the West is supportive. So I think our troops are in much better physical and psychological condition than back half a year ago. Okay, we have about 340,000 viewers. Please, uh, my usual ask, continue clicking the like button if you have not done that yet. And of course, subscribe to Fagin Live, to Alexei Arstovich, and to the privateer station. This is very important. All right. In your view, one more question about supplies of armaments. The last ones that we saw 
in the list were UAVs that are being given to Ukraine, and there were different communications about uh, tanks. Seems like Russian propaganda is playing on the tune that tanks will be delayed, will not be supplied in time for spring counteroffensive. How do you estimate that matter? I have one very logical argument, Mark, but unfortunately I cannot name it right now. Remember that tweet of mine that basically shows that everything, there is an indicator that shows everything is good with tanks, with preparation of the offensive, and they know it, and they're just trying to play that game. Russian propaganda is rather stupid. It does more harm often than good. They're either boosting wrong expectations or dampening down the correct ones. And when China stated, for example, that there will not be military supplies in China is for territorial integrity in Russia internally, they were screaming that now weapons will start coming from China and uh, Russia will easily win this war. So total opposite of what's happening. And when, when China unfolded that, uh, even Medvedev came out and said that, oh, we don't care about Chinese plan, we'll look at that later. First we'll get to Poland and then we'll look at the offer by China. So I think we are good. I think we have everything ready. I think we're just waiting for good weather. So when the fields become dry, yeah, middle of April, roughly when because the tank needs some drier soil in order to not get stuck in the mud and i would say about middle of april i think everybody understands everything and if american analysts are drawing the plans of entering of ukraine troops taking crimea or entering crimea and General Hodges is, for example, an important figure. I've met him in person, and when he talks about that, that's a significant sign. He was the commander of U U.S. troops in Europe. He's uh, one of the highest levels in American command in Europe. And when he's looking at the situation of taking Crimea back, I have no concerns that we will be there, we will be doing it. Speaking of equipment, it will be supplied on time. 700 tanks and a thousand armored vehicles. That's total numbers. Um, and there are other interesting elements that we're seeing. Germany promised to send an experimental equipment that is very highly programmable to fight drones and UAVs and that's basically an experimental defense system. For example, as we see, German military complex is really interested in using this opportunity to test out their weapons. Because in the international weapons market, there is a line that says combat-proofed. So if the weapon has it, it has a higher demand, and our allies are using this opportunity to prove some of their designs. Also, an important thing that we are getting trade on a scale of battalions from the commander to the cook. And besides, and besides uh, that kind of training, a uh, very advanced one, we are getting a system of a tactical fight, tactical battle fight, which is increasing a tool that can increase our decision making times over. This basically is a collusion of internet with the Cherepana brothers steam engine. This is the war that Ukrainian troops are being prepared for. So if we are equipped with these tactical systems, our ways and our speed of making decisions at the front at the battle will topple anything that Russia can provide on their side. So I think our 
Starship troopers will show will shine in the future offensive, but um, if indeed we are, this is not a. I cannot fully confirm that, but if we are indeed going to use an integrated system of uh, battle command, tactical battle command, will be 2.5, four times faster in making tactical decisions than Russian side. And if you manage to make four decisions and they barely got enough information for one, then your losses will be times less than theirs. And if the fighting will be on the southern front, where you'd not need to do direct frontal attacks, where you have a lot of ability for maneuvering, for encircling, for flank attacks. So I think, in my estimations, our counteroffensive will be liked by most uh, viewers, by, by most those who are paying attention to what's happening, except for one country, right? Uh, I would even say country, one side of that war who will be the butt of that. Um, okay, we're almost 32 minutes live. We have a little bit of time. We talked about Moldova and your plan that you outlined that even before the end of war, there may be some events unfolding. And the continuation, didn't, we did not wait for long to see Moscow pick it up. They are starting to prop the party of uh, some criminal dude, Shore, the husband of their singer, Jasmine. He's uh, a rather mafia figure. So they brought him in, with, uh, brought him more, pe more activists from Russia, as I understand. I don't know how they made it to Moldova, but they are starting some work on updating their fortifications on the border of Transnistria and Ukraine. I think they're preparing for a possible entry by Ukrainian troops to Transnistria. And on one hand, they're doing something to destabilize because the protests they're trying to run to scare Sandu so she would not turn to Zelensky with, with an appeal to help us to eliminate that separatist uh, enclave there. That's a political attempt. And the military one is to try to mobilize at the same time and maybe upgrade their fortifications so they can at least hold if Ukraine decides to intervene. So they listened to that signal and they started some preparations. I'm not even talking about diplomatic screams that they're producing outwards. Are you winking that we might have started this process? I don't know, Alexei. I am never taking responsibility like that, but there is some connectivity here. Yeah, I don't want to be solely responsible for that, right? I think I just joined together. Things came together because you know how it happens. If you talked here, 300,000 watched this live, 1.5 million altogether. And then among those who are watching are the ones who are making decisions. Let's just say that this is another important block, and it's a good thing that we make a pause here. I would say that events in Moldova have started. And if they have started, the space of decisions is narrowing rapidly. So things that they could have agreed to in peaceful times, now that option is dwindling, 10,000 possible protesters that they were brought somehow to Kishinev is a significant threat. That is, if Putin's regime would bring somehow 100,000 to Kiev for protests. So that's important. That's, that's a big threat. And Transnistria itself, they started military exercises on the 1st of March. I'm not the representative of government. This is my personal view. But I would want to remind our Moldovan neighbors that Ukraine is your nearest neighbor. And we are ready to help you if you need a hand. We are ready to do that. Do you think they might use it? I don't know. It's their sovereign decision to make. But we are ready. We can quote the, our president who said we are ready. Okay. We'll see how that unfolds. It's an interesting situation and it does have a huge impact 
because it's not just liberation of Transnistria from Russian occupation, and it's not just uh, a small strip of land that you liberate, but this is actually alleviating a threat to Ukraine. And the uh, wave of uh, information strike on Russia will be stronger probably three times than Kherson. And all their rhetoric about expanding or protecting or having their territories here and there, that's sending a message back saying, no, you don't. So this is uh, an attempt to change the picture of the world that Moscow was uh, producing, saying that this is the buffer zone we are using. These are not real countries. These are just the buffer zone between us and the West. So we can start stamping it out and saying, no, these are countries. These are independent countries. And it's a good signal that uh, right now we are getting to the post-Putin's world. You mean where Russia doesn't have a hegemony like that? Not even that, when we don't even have that politics. Remember when Lavrov, when the Minister of Foreign Affairs was asked, where is the next, when he was visiting Kazakhstan or somewhere, when he was asked, where is the next hot zone, hot spot after Ukraine? He said, no, don't worry, Kazakhstan is not that. Moldova will be the next one. So that was the dumbest statement that I've heard, but yeah. Now, this was basically a direct threat to a sovereign state in the message by Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs. You know, the, their grandfathers were dying in the Second World War to build a world where these things cannot be repeated, where one abuser cannot just attack everybody and grab their territories. Their grandfathers were dying to stop that. And now the grandkids are at the age of their grandfathers and they're doing their 70s and they're now doing the politics to undo everything that their grandfathers fought for. So the main message of the Second World War in Soviet Union was that we were fighting so there would never be a war. There would never be a next world war. And these guys are saying we can repeat. And we're eager to do that. And they love to dress their kids in military uniforms and celebrate all kinds of occasions with their kids in soldier dressed up as soldiers and I, I, people are and i do separate victory and victory fanatics victory psychos so these are the ones the psychos are the ones who are trampling on that whole topic they're stomping on the graves of their grandfathers and they're propelling the ideas of war and that they're ready to fight war and they want to fight war they are destroying that system they are destroying everything that their grandfathers and ancestors fought against. And they're behaving as Hitler without care to other countries and their peoples. This is our territory. That is our territory. We'll ignite another fire over there. If their grandfathers were alive, they would have spat on their faces. You idiots, what the heck are you doing? We were fighting to stop wars. You know, like, say, those, their grandfathers were pretty rough. They could have... Uh, used some weapons to put an end to that. Um, we have a few more minutes. I want to bring up another piece of news. That story with uh, Russia quitting the agreement about tactical nukes, uh, about strategic uh, offensive uh, nuclear munitions. Russia said that we are going to stop taking part in that and the United States countered and said that they're still ready to work with Russia on that agreement and they're ready to meet and discuss grievances regarding that uh, nuclear arsenal. It's obvious that Moscow is using nukes again to blackmail. They've done, they've used natural gas, they've used energy structures, they were trying to freeze Ukraine as another part of blackmail more nuclear threats from the Zaporozhye nuclear plant, grain blackmail, and now they're going with that scenario will freeze our participation in that nuclear agreement and the events will be unfolding in an uncontrolled fashion. Hoping that, especially for Democrats on the American side, 
it will press some buttons. And American Democrats are the ones who are protagonists for these uh, international agreements. Personally, I think this contract was never really fulfilled. Putin, in his message to his Federal Assembly, did say that inspections have not been carried out for quite some time. And he would, of course, uh, he was, of course, playing card. Let us go back to that uh, contract, nuclear contract with you, but you make sure Ukraine sits at the table and you get your contract back and we, and we get the parts that we captured in Ukraine. Mark, answer me the question, if there'll be another weapons arms race, how will American economy and Russian economy react to that? America will be screaming for joy, right? Yeah, they'll be giddy to produce and to make more money. What about Russian economy? They'll be screaming in horror. They already are out of resources. And one only needs to remember the war, the destiny of USSR, the war in Afghanistan during the collapse of oil prices. And that's similar to what's happening now. Now the prices are not really falling, but the proceeds of oil are really not coming to Russian budget in a previous uh, volume. Very interesting construct, how the West done it. But basically, coming out of any agreement from armaments uh, is uh, essentially you, you do what? You, you ignite another arms race? That'll be an end to Russia. Because, uh, you know, what they say, when God wants to punish somebody, they take away their logic. They're losing their adequacy. They're not psychologically yet, but logically, they're definitely has lost all adequacy. It's when they're so pissed, they're going to go to the end. Like with the casino, remember we talked about? When they're gambling till the last underwear? Yeah, they... They might even understand that they're making stupid statements, but they just don't know how to stop. It's like when China is your only possible ally in this conflict and you're barking at China. When you need to control your budget and then you quit some agreement and provoke the opposing party, opposing side to start arms race. So you're going to participate in that. And then you have another attempt, another option to unite your nation over something, but instead you come out with a message saying, we'll start executing everybody who is protesting against us. So this is interesting. And I think it's not just for politologists, it's also for psychiatrists to research later. You know, I have a friend who is uh, going around the world in a yacht and he's done it six times and they had some television group with them going near Antarctic so they're going on the engines and not on the sails and it's a clear weather clear skies we see a huge log in the water ahead of us and I'm telling and he was telling his friend do you see that log yeah I do and why are we not turning away from that and he's saying we both, both of us saw that we didn't do anything. We we're just observing and standing there as they hit the log and destroyed, uh, suffered some damage. And they basically had to spend next two months refitting and fixing the boat. So I've observed these situations uh, times and times again with some people when they fall prey to some program that engaged and they see and observe and understand that it's going to be fatal, but they're still not doing anything. They just can't. They understand they will fall at the end of it, but they continue to go the, to keep the route, to keep the course, because they're captured by this program. I think uh, I have the feeling that Russian leadership is uh, now under control of one of these programs. And if that's what's happening, then all we need to do is uh, do the best, help them realize that program, help this program to unfold. Right, right, or put them in hospice. Um, 300,000 plus are watching us live. We have the very, very last announcements for today. We are continuing our project, Fagin and Aristovich. It is a charity merchandising project that are being sold uh, in Ukraine, in Europe, in the United States. And your proceeds go to support the victims of this war. So here's another one. It's just an endless 
kaleidoscope of victims. And unfortunately, we are limited to how much we can support, but we're trying. I think we have four or five thousand euros in the bank. There is one story that became public. I'm bringing it up to the screen. This is a Ukrainian Truth publication. They published a story of a girl who lost a leg. She was a soldier and as a result of the mortar shelling, she lost a leg during one of her battle tasks. Uh, we're trying to reach out to her, if you know her family or perhaps her loved one or uh, yeah, guys who served with her, give us some information how to get in touch. We would like to help her as well. So here is the ask to our viewers. Please send that to our mail. The girl's name is Rusa, Ruslana. She was only 18 when she joined the army and uh, she was carrying out uh, active operations when she suffered that wound. She basically almost lost her life, but she was saved uh, by the doctors. And uh, yeah, please give us the data. We'll show you where and how, who will be the next grantees. And uh, we'll try, we'll try. I think that's it. Thank you very much, Alexei. We've been live for about 47 minutes. 330,000 are still with us. Uh, please share the links in your social media. Click the like button and do not forget to subscribe and click that bell so you do see our updates when we post. Sorry, we kind of uh, sticking out of the usual format today in a different backgrounds and all, but we'll see you again soon. When? Friday? Friday. Let's uh, shoot for Friday, 9 p.m. 9 p.m. Okay, this will come out Saturday Eastern time around uh, 9 morning in the United States. And we'll discuss uh, everything that we that will unfold until then. It'll be day 373. See you then. Goodbye.